Uh, so why don't we get started again? Uh, my name is Kit Dahl. I'm the uh, count, council staff person who stops our fishery ecosystem plan. And uh, this is the fourth in a series of webinars we've been holding um, in connection with the Climate and Communities Initiative under the uh, fishery ecosystem plan. And uh, today, the subject of the presentation is state and federally managed fishery participation under different climate scenarios. We have three presenters. They're all from the Northwest Fishery Science Center, Dan Holland, Jerry Leonard, and Kate Richardson. Um, and also just a note there, as you can see on the screen, that a member of the ecosystem work group is going to be taking notes. Um, the EWG will plans to provide summaries of the webinars uh, as part of the material they'll present in, in March to the Council. So just a few logistical notes. Many of you have heard this more than once, but I'll go through it just in case. Um, so first of all, participants have been muted. Um, the exception is we went ahead and unmuted the members of the ecosystem work group. Um, and um, there will be an opportunity uh, for, for a question and answer or comment period after the presentation. And so at that time, if you do have a question or a comment, you can use the hand raise feature in the GoToWebinar software platform. That will be the indication to us here at the council office that you want to ask a question and we'll unmute you for that uh, opportunity. Um, otherwise, for those of you that work group members, as you already know, but just to repeat it, that are unmuted, uh, please, when you're not speaking, mute your phone just uh, so we avoid any background noise. Uh, if you're having technical issues with the uh, GoToWebinar platform, you can call Chris Kleinschmidt here in our office. His uh, phone number is shown up there on the screen. It's 503-820-2411. We are recording this presentation, and, and as we have been doing for uh, this uh, webinar series, um, the, the recordings will be available on our website not too long after this uh, uh, webinar is completed. So um, that's uh, all I have to say. I will uh, just check and see if the chair of the ecosystem work group, work group Yvonne Nerenye, if she wants to have say anything uh, prefacing this presentation, and then we can turn it over to the presenters. No, I don't have anything exciting to say. Thank you so much, Kit, for giving us the introduction. I just want to check and make sure uh, that Corey Niles is on. Um, so that we do have a repertoire, and then uh, we can move on. I'm here. You can hear me. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you very much, Dan, Jerry, and Kate, for coming to present to us. Take it away. OK. Uh, I think we need to share our screen. Oh. Yeah, we're in the process. OK. I just hit the little button, so can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, and so you should now see a, a title slide. Yep. All right. I guess we're good to go here. Um, so the the title here for this this set of talks is is slightly changed from what you had on the webinar title there, but very close. Modeling changes in fishery participation and economic impacts in response to climate variation and climate change. Uh, I'm Dan Holland. I'm an economist at the Conservation Biology Division uh, at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. I'll be giving part of the webinar today. Jerry Leonard, who's an economist in the FRAM Division here at the Northwest Center, is um, going to give a talk as well. And then Kate Richardson, who's a postdoc um, officially with UW right now, actually, but he also an affiliate here at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, will give a talk as well. So the, the way we have this structured, we have three talks. Um, they're, they're distinct talks, um, but they have a common theme or focus. And that focus is how will climate-driven changes in the California current ecosystem affect fishers and fishing communities? 
So I'll give the first presentation um, that's titled Dynamics of Adaptation to Climate Driven Variability in the California Current Fisheries and Fishing Communities. Uh, Jerry will give a second talk, um, which is uh, titled Atlantis, an Input Output Model for Pacific Coast Fisheries IOPAC Collaborations. And Kate will conclude with a presentation titled Quantifying and Predicting Impacts of Salmon Ocean Fishery Closures. The uh, presentations in total should take about an hour, so there should be plenty of time for discussion after them, um, possibly between them. I'm not sure how, how you typically work these webinars, so we could have questions in between or we can wait until the end. All right, so yep. let me um, go ahead and launch into the first talk, um, which is the dynamics of ad adaptation to climate-driven variability in California current fisheries and fishing communities. Uh, this is a multi-year collaborative project um, with funding for non-NOAA collaborators, collaborators pro provided by a grant from the National Science Foundation. Josh Abbott, who is an economist at Arizona State University, is the lead PI uh, on this NSF grant. And Andre Punt, uh, who's at the University of Washington, all of you, most of you know, I'm sure. Uh, Melissa Poe also, who's at UWC grant, our principal investigators on the grant. Uh, as is Malin Pinsky and Rut, uh, from Rutgers. Uh, the NOAA collaborators on the project uh, include Carmen Norman, uh, who is here at the Northwest Center, and myself, and Nate Mantua at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. And Kate Richardson, um, who will give one of the talks today, has been a postdoc on the project uh, at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center for the last two years, actually, since before we got, before we got the grant. So, um, the project is still in its early stages. Uh, I'll talk about the overall project, including motivation, objectives, structure, and I'll describe some of the work done so far, as well as some of the planned work. I'll focus in particular on the results of a mail survey we conducted last year and how we plan to use that survey. Um, for those of you on the ecosystem working group and maybe a few people, um, I'm afraid some of this may be uh, a repeat of, of some, some of the material you saw last September, but I was um, led to understand that there are other people that will be watching that for whom this material will be new, and there is a little bit of new material here as, as well. Uh, and then I think the, new, the other talks are, are um, new material. All right, so let me first talk a little bit about the, the motivation um, for this project. Uh, it was motivated by the observation that revenues uh, for West Coast communities are derived from uh, fisheries that come from a diversity of state and federally managed fisheries uh, that are interconnected not only um, by a shared environment and, and climate, um, but by fishers that move in and out and between the fisheries. The share of revenue, revenues attributed to different species groups across the entire West Coast, as well as for individual individual communities and fishermen has varied substantially over recent decades, and it can change a lot uh, from one year to the next. Governance of these fisheries uh, in the California current is, is accomplished through a complex mixture of federal and state management, as well as international treaties for a handful of straddling stocks. Although some of the species groups are managed under a single management plan, most species are managed individually, often uh, independent management by each state, um, for the same species, despite significant uh, biological economic connections across the fisheries and states. Um, there are narrow mandates, high transaction costs of cooperation and scarcity of funding that have all resulted in research programs and management plans that are sometimes insular and fail to account for interdependence of the fisheries. The overlap and participation um, creates interconnections between many of these fisheries. Um, many of the West Coast fishermen participate in multiple fisheries, moving between them and throughout them over the year, adapting their participation in response to changes in relative profitability, spatial distributions, and regulations. A combination of natural, regulatory, spatial, technological factors uh, can make participation in certain fisheries complementary, while others may be substitutes, making it difficult to participate in, in both of them. Uh, just looking at 2016 revenues, you can see that 43% of fishers with more than $5,000 uh, in revenue from West Coast fishing in 2016 fished in more than one fishery. 63% of those fishers um, with more than 5000 in ground fish revenue fished in more than one fishery. 
50, 52% of crabbers, 36% of salmon fishers. Um, and the, the pie graphs there show uh, the re total revenues for groups of fishermen that were uh, that, that had revenues in particular fisheries. So um, the upper left shows the groups of fishermen that had, had more than $5,000 in revenue in crab and the overall, where, where their revenue came from overall, you can see it's mostly from crab. But if you look at salmon, um, more than half of the revenue from, for, group, for the group of fishermen that fish in the salmon fishery comes from sources other than salmon, um, crab being a big one. And the same is true of ground fish um, where you see a lot of revenue coming from other, uh, other, other sources other than, than ground fish. So the project, uh, the overall project has three main objectives. Um, the first is to understand how environmental variability travels through and is dampened or amplified by the linked social and ecological processes uh, in this system of fisheries. Um, we want to explore how a more integrated management of these fisheries could be used to increase resilience and the human benefits derived from, uh, from the fisheries, specifically the commercial fisheries. Um, and we want to engage disparate parts of the fishery management community, um, in particular state and federally managed fisheries managers um, and industry in those, in those fisheries to develop uh, an application of, of the research and modeling tools that are needed to, to implement ecosystem-based fisheries management. Uh, the project will explore a number of questions uh, that I think are important to understanding how California current fisheries are affected by climate variation and how fishers, managers, and communities could be more resilient to this climate variation and potentially to future climate change as well. So some of the key questions are, uh, do differential effects of environmental conditions across species make it possible for fishers to form robust portfolios of fisheries? Uh, in other words, can they have a mix of fisheries that they participate in that will reduce the variation in their income and make them more resilient? Um, how do biological fluctuations interact with management, economic, and social psychological factors to influence the flow of effort across fisheries, uh, in between, in and out of fisheries? How do these adaptations feed back to the variability and robustness of this system? For example, do fishers' adaptations moderate or exacerbate ecosystem variability? induced by climate variation, uh, and how do management and access regimes affect this relationship? Lastly, can an understanding of the dynamics of the system of fisheries enable managers to anticipate and perhaps mitigate effects of climate variation? All right, the, the project includes work that's under four interconnecting themes, uh, and I'll describe sort of each of these themes very briefly. Um, theme one is focused on linking environmental variability to marine species recruitment and distribution. Uh, we plan to analyze, or we started to analyze, what drives variability in productivity and spatial distribution of California current fisheries or species, and how that variability is correlated across them. Um, we'll analyze the extent to which these species population dynamics are synchronized um, across species and how that relates to climate variability. Uh, this work is being led uh, by Malin Pinsky at Rutgers. Now, there's a lot of work that's been done in this area already on particular species, like salmon, crab, other species that, are, that clearly vary quite a lot with climate variation, um, but less work has been done looking at how uh, that variation is correlated across different fisheries, across different species. And that's probably where our, our real contribution will be. All right, the, the second theme is focused on understanding psychological and social benefits and drivers of fishery participation. Um, for example, how do personal preferences for fishing versus socially influenced identity serve as a motivation for participation in fisheries? What role do non-fishery sources of income play in fishing households and how does that affect participation? What role does social capital play in participation? What role does seafood retained for personal use play and sharing of seafood? play uh, in fishing households and communities and how does it affect participation. Uh, Melissa Poe, Carmen Norman, and I have been leading the work in this area. Um, and it's uh, ongoing. And then uh, the third theme uh, is focused on modeling the dynamics of fisher participation um, with statistical behavioral models. Um, standard participation models 
uh, at least ones done by economists tend to assume that participation is based, based mainly on or solely on expected profit and generally don't account for choices and movement between fisheries. We want to explore other factors that drive participation decisions. For example, we will model how non-monetary factors such as job satisfaction, social capital, and identity affect participation decisions, and how non-fishery income opportunities affect participation, uh, what they are, how, how much they can make, and, and what the timing of those opportunities is. Uh, we'll also analyze substitutability and complementarity of different fisheries uh, and you know, how well they can work to form portfolios. Josh Abbott, uh, economist at Arizona State University, is leading the work under this theme. And again, uh, several people in the project will be involved with this. The final theme is uh, integrates the work of the, of the first three th themes. Um, and the, the, the work is really to develop a linked multi-fishery bioeconomic modeling framework um, that we can use to evaluate the interconnectedness of these fisheries. Uh, we expect that this one will include, uh, at this point, we're figuring gr uh, ground fish, Dungeness crab, salmon, pink shrimp, and albacore. Um, those are the fisheries where we think we see the most uh, interconnectedness that's caused by cross-participation. Even though there are other fisheries that are obviously very important to overall revenue, but these are the ones we, f we feel are interconnected through these human processes. Uh, the model will be used to explore how uh, exogenous shocks, such as climate variation or input and output price fluctuations, can propagate through the system. We'll explore whether management systems and fishing strategies, for example, diversification with specific portfolios, can reduce variability of income for individuals and communities and increase resilience to climate variability uh, and possibly climate change. Andre Punt and I will lead the model development of this theme but this theme will integrate the work done in other three themes and will involve all of the project team, uh, as well as a, a postdoc will do a, probably end up doing a lot of the heavy lifting. All right, so uh, to give you an idea of kind of how all this work fi fits together and a little bit of where, where we're at with the project and the progress we've made, um, we've begun work on this project in 2016, um, actually before we got the grant from NSF, um, we had some other funding from NOAA to get it started. Um, in 2017, we conducted a mail survey of fishermen, which I'll talk more about later. Um, we're also conducting interviews with fishermen to get information about what motivates their decisions to participate in fisheries and what affects their well being. Uh, we have been constructing and analyzing time series of data on species productivity, um, recruitment, uh, and distribution, uh, how that relates to ocean conditions and in an effort to identify correlations of productivity with climate uh, and ocean conditions, and also whether uh, some fish stocks uh, vary, their productivity varies synchronously or asynchronously. Uh, over the next few years, we'll construct uh, an integrated bioeconomic model of the Key, Co Key West Coast fisheries, as I mentioned before, for theme four. Uh, and then once that integrated multi-fishery model has been developed, um, probably in early stage of development, um, we hope to hold a workshop with fishery managers and industry participants to consider the results of um, some initial model simulations. And that workshop is meant then to um, get some feedback from them, uh, from stakeholders and, and industry on the model, the plausibility of, of the results that are coming out of it, and also to, to identify questions and scenarios that might be of particular interest uh, to managers and, and stakeholders. We had uh, envisioned originally having an earlier workshop, which I, like I mentioned last September, and we've opted in the end um, not to have that wor first workshop. We've been getting uh, input basically through other processes, including engagement with the, with the council here. Um, and uh, yeah, there's the, the upcoming workshop that Nature Conservancy, I think, is, is going to run that we hope to, to be able to uh, engage people there as well. So I want to talk now a little bit more in depth about um, some of the work under theme two, and in particular this survey that we ran. Um, the survey was, as I, as I mentioned, was done last spring. Uh, we targeted, we sent the survey out to about 2,800 2, West Coast uh, vessel owners that had been active in, in the commercial fisheries in 2015 or 16, had some, some revenue. Um, 
much to our surprise, we had uh, over a 50% participation rate. Uh, it might have been helped out a little bit by the fact that we put in a, a $5 cash incentive in the envelopes that we sent out. Um, but uh, we also made it a quite a short survey. It was only about a 20 minute, should have only taken about 20 minutes or less to, to fill out, which I think helped um, with, with uh, getting a high response rate. The survey uh, was focused on, particular on, on understanding non-monetary and indirect motivations for fishery participation, including job satisfaction, identity, social capital related to fishing. And we also asked about diversification of income with non-fishery sources of income and how that might affect fishery participation. Uh, and some questions about catch kept for personal use that we were interested in uh, as potential drivers of participation, but also um, as a research topic in its own right. All right, so now I'm going to I'm going to talk about a part of the survey that was kind of focused on some of these non-monetary uh, reasons for participation, uh, and some of the and present a few of the of the basic results from that. Um, just frequency frequency charts here. Um, we we're interested in social capital related to fishing in part because we believe it may drive fishery participation decisions. For example, making someone less likely to exit the fishery when profitability is down. Um, we're also interested in what affects social capital in communities and how, how it develops the dynamics of social capital over time. Um, we included a number of questions that serve as indicators of social capital and that together we can use the index of social capital at the individual level. These include how long the individual has been fishing, the number of generations the family has been fishing, the proportion of family and friends involved in the industry, uh, how they think the occupation of fishing is perceived in the community that they live in, and where they sh whether they share their catch with family and friends. All of these are, are, are thought to be indicator variables of social capital. Now, sometimes people measure social capital with a networking approach, looking at how many people people know and stuff. Uh, we, that's a little bit more difficult to do uh, on a large scale. And so we've, we've chose this more indirect <laughs> approach looking at indicators of social capital. We also ask questions designed to measure the degree to which an individual's identity is tied to fishery participation uh, and the fishing community. Again, we expect that individuals with an identity strongly tied to fishing may be less likely to exit a fishery when profitability declines. So maybe an important, important part of the participation modeling. Um, so you can see here some of the questions that we asked there, um, whether uh, being continuing a tradition of a fishing community was important to them, uh, whether being a fisherman was important, a family tradition. Uh, it's interesting that um, for the most part, there were quite strong responses, a little bit less about uh, in terms of uh, continuing a, a family tradition, I think, which we found a lot of fishermen don't necessarily want their children to become fishers. We asked questions about job satisfaction uh, related to a variety of characteristics and qualities of fishing as an occupation. Um, job satisfaction may also affect participation choices and may influence which fisheries uh, with different qualities individuals are more prone to fish in and what factors may make them more prone to enter or exit a particular fishery. So this set of questions um, was derived from, from prior research done um, by other researchers, particularly Dick Polnack in other fisheries around uh, the globe actually. Um, so we picked out some of these characteristics um, of job satisfaction uh, that we can kind of compare to what's also what's been done in, in, in prior studies. We asked about how many crew vessel owners. Well, I guess we'll go back to that and just just mention here again that um, you know for the most part this suggests a fairly high level of job satisfaction in terms of a lot of the characteristics of of fishing. You know things like being on the water and um, producing healthy food, challenge for job, et cetera, uh, a little bit lower in terms of um, earnings and predictability of earnings in particular, uh, and in job safety. Um, and um, when we actually look at this in, in, a, in a factor analysis, we find that those top three there, job safety, predictability of earnings, and earnings from fishing, um, the answers to those tend to be not quite so tightly correlated with the others. And you can kind of see some differences among individuals about job satisfaction with regards to those and some of the other factors. Uh, we also asked about how many crew they uh, people employ and, and 
whether they have continued fishing even when it's not profitable to do so in order to cover expenses for crew, another, another potential source of sort of stickiness in behavior. We had a number of questions that ask about household income and uh, the, the percent of household income that comes from fishing, the percent that the individual themselves um, gets from something other than fishing and, and when they uh, earn, inf earn uh, income from other things other than fishing that might preclude them or give them an alternative to fishing. And we also asked them about their, their preferences for fishing over other jobs and, and you know, how much more they'd have to get paid to do something else. Now we have, uh, this is one way to kind of test um, the, re the relatedness of you know, how, how social capital and various other things affect this answer, but we can also then look at actual behavior and, and um, see whether, whether people are uh, tend to be more likely to stay in, in fisheries or not. Um, I don't want to go into great detail about this, mainly because it's work that I'm just starting and it's only sort of half-baked at, at best, but um, we're using factor analysis and structural equation modeling to create indices from the, some of those questions. So the job satisfaction questions or the identity or social capital questions, you can create indices or sort of latent variables that um, from, from those observed from the answers to those questions and then look at how those relate to some of these factors um, that indicate sort of stickiness in behavior or a reluctance to leave the fishery when job status when, when uh, the uh, profitability is, is low for example so the idea then is that um, we have this information from the survey on identity and social capital and job satisfaction kind of personal preferences uh, and that, in addition to other information about individuals in terms of their the, their their constraints they might have based on where they're fish where they fish, the permits they have, the boat type, and such, um, those combine with with characteristics of the fisheries themselves, um, like seasonality, accessibility, catchability, regulations, and prices, um, to moderate behavior or to influence participation decisions in this group. Uh, this group of fisheries and the group of fisheries then, of course, influenced by outside factors like climate variability. So that's sort of the framework then for how this information uh, feeds into participation modeling, which is the, the work under three, theme three, which is just now now get going, getting going. So that I think is all I was going to say about this project, um, which, as I mentioned, is is still uh, really in its early stages. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to Jerry, who's going to give the next talk. Okay, so I'm Jerry Leonard, uh, economist here in the FRAM division at the Northwest Center. Um, I've been doing um, mostly economic impact type stuff for quite some time now. Uh, some of these slides have been around a while, so some of you have, may have seen them before. Um, but Dan and I thought it might be useful uh, to to talk some about the IOPAC model and the collaborations that we've done with, uh, with the Atlantis model, in part because we've been successful doing it. And um, it's, a, it's a tool that's sort of off the shelf. Uh, both Atlantis and IOPAC are both updated regularly and there's a considerable amount of resources uh, devoted to maintaining them so they are useful in a climate change sort of setting um, however there are some rather significant limitations to that as well uh, to their use what are you doing i'm wondering if they're seeing this but... are you guys seeing this on the screen it... yeah whether you guys see the see this this thing here well Oh, or how we can. No, I don't think that's good. All right. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Um, sorry about that. So, um, anyway, so um, some of this will be repeated, but I, I think it's useful to see um, the how input output models has been used in conjunction with the ecosystem model, um, particularly in a climate change setting, and, and I'd try to understand some of the some of the limitations that are involved in doing that. Um, so. 
sorry about that again. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, and, and input output modeling is a really uh, uh, regional economies. It starts with a realization that regional economies are an interconnected system of entities, much like an ecosystem. Uh, you could say that uh, regional economy is sort of its own ecosystem of a sort, um, and where outputs from one industry become inputs into another. Uh, industries purchase inputs from other sectors and industry sell outputs to other sectors. Um, really the novel thing in an input output model uh, is this detailed accounting framework that creates a picture of the flow of goods between industries and consumers. Um, and it can be used to predict changes in overall economic activity as a result of some shock or exogenous change to a regional economy. Um, this graph, uh, here is something that uh, I saw Ed Waters in a previous presentation give, and so I uh, asked him where he got it, and uh, he got it from this northern economic source that's cited there. But I think it, it is useful to help uh, sort of uh, people understand what you're trying to do when you're trying to estimate economic impact. So well, on the left-hand side there, you'll see a dollar sign where it says project expenditures. In our application, you want to think of that as the actual harvest, the fishery harvest in terms of revenue. Some of that revenue is going to leak out of an area. Like let's say you're looking at Newport, Oregon, for example. When vessels go and purchase food for their crew and uh, that sort of thing, part of, part of that are fuel. Part of the money leaks out right away to some uh, maybe some agriculture producer that's in Nebraska or California or elsewhere, but some of that money stays in the area. And so that money that stays in the area becomes what is known as the direct local impacts. And to that direct local impacts, you have this multiplier effect, which I'm sure many of you have heard about before. What the multiplier effect is really trying to do is it's trying to capture the effect of a change in fishery harvest on everything that feeds the harvesting sector in a sense. So when harvesters have a shock to revenue, that affects the amount of purchases they make on bait and on uh, maintenance, purchases from of, of diesel fuel from uh, uh, fuel providers, purchases from grocery stores, and then those uh, affected entities all have their own purchases that are affected. So what really you're trying to do with this multiplier effect is count the backward linked effect, it's called, of a shock on demand. But in this case, we don't have really a shock on demand in terms of a demand for seafood. We have a shock on the production of seafood. And IO models can be used in that instance. There is a certain uh, things you have to take into account to ensure that uh, double counting doesn't occur. But in a sense, that's what your multiplier is trying to do. So some of the key assumptions in IO models is what is also the source of their limitations, particularly in a climate change setting. Um, the main assumptions, the limiting assumptions are the supply outputs is unlimited. So an increase in demand will always be met with an increase in supply. So let's say, let's take an example where um, all the fish harvested on the West Coast, every vessel that harvests fish, on, harvests fish on the West Coast wants to move to and become part of the Newport, Oregon community, let's say. Um, now, if that were to happen, you might imagine there would be a lot of increased demand for moorage, increased demand for diesel fuel in Newport, so on and so forth. And in an I.O. model, it says that all of those demands will be met. And in, in a long-term situation, that may or may not be applicable. In addition, not only will supply, the all demand be met by an increase of, in supply, the prices are fixed. So regardless of what happens to the demand for moorage, in our example, in Newport, there will be no increase in the price or the, the fee of mooring your boat there. Uh, so prices are fixed. And the last one is that there are there is zero substitution allowed in either production or consumption, which just says that if something were to happen where uh, 
some realistic thing happened where there was a constraint on a factor of production, let's say, you couldn't find good crew members, that sort of thing, you couldn't substitute to something else. So if you were to have an increase in the price of diesel fuel, uh, you know, economics would suggest that you vessels would perhaps invest in greater efficient diesel engines for their vessels. Well, in an IO model, that can't happen. Um, so the, that brings us to the IOPEC model, which is the model that um, the Northwest Center has spent a considerable amount of resources developing and maintaining. Uh, the objective was to develop a regional economic model to describe the impacts associated with marine resources. The main things you should get from this slide are that it was intended, always was intended to be used for both commercial and recreational fishing. It has a very flexible geographic resolution. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, it was intended to be used for both regulatory or environmental changes that affect harvest. And it, it was intended to uh, be continually, easily able to update continually. So in terms of the study areas for the IOPAC model, you have, um, you could do study areas on a just about any combination of counties on the west coast that you want. And so we can look at in whole states, we can look at the whole west coast as one big study area, we can look at individual port areas, and the port areas that are on the right side of this slide are those that are used in ground fish harvest specifications, and we have a different set of counties um, on the rec side for for ground fish harvest specifications, and we have even a different group grouping on the salmon side of things. Um, so the model consists of 20 vessel classifications, um, which are listed there on the left-hand pane of this slide. And those vessel classifications go way back before my time. They were defined by uh, Radke and Davis' paper. I think it came out in about 2004. Um, and the, one of the neat things about IOPAC is that we have this translation from those uh, vessel categories into these what we call commodity categories on the right-hand side, which are just simply species targets with different types of gear, so that you can have sable fish targeted with fixed gear, and you see on the left-hand side you have sable fish fixed gear vessels, but not all sable fish harvested with fixed gear is done by vessels categorized as such. So some of them, some of the landings are done by crabbers, shrimpers, large ground fish trawlers, et cetera, let's say. So, and we use PACFIN data to make up this, to give us this commodity to vessel classification mapping. So the model is very, uses data sources, a large number of data sources, it's very, data intensive on, on the fishery side of things of, about the inputs that vessels are using and how the sort of production technology that they're using to harvest fish. Um, so there's a variety of surveys that we have here. Most of these are cost earning surveys listed across this slide in the columns. Um, I'll talk more about those cost earning surveys, but you'll see there are some other things in there that are not cost earning surveys. So the Marine Rec Expenditure Survey, um, it's not really germane to this conversation very much, but we use that to model rec impacts. We also have the in-plan data, which is basically all the economic data for an area that's not fishery specific. So anything about hardware stores, grocery stores, uh, shipyards, that sort of thing, all comes from in-plan. Um, Cost and earnings data, we have three main cost earnings data surveys here, uh, which and I'll, I'll get at why we're doing these in just a second, but we have an open access ground fish, salmon troll, salmon net, crab shrimp. So basically anything with over $1,000 of landings, any vessel with over $1,000 of landings in any of those species, we're gonna target. Um, and there's about 1,700 vessels in the last, in the population of the last survey that was done. Um, and then we have the limited entry fixed gear survey, which is primarily fishery uh, vessels in the tiered sable fish fishery. And then we have the EDC program, which probably you're familiar with, that uh, collects data from anyone involved in the trawl catch share program. So from 
both vessels and first receivers and processors, we collect information. Um, so what we're aiming to do with those surveys is create this here, which is basically shows a cost function for particular types of vessels. So for every dollar of fish that's landed by a vessel classified as an Alaska fishery vessel, 13.4 cents of that dollar is going to be go to pay the captain and 19.6 percent is going to pay the crew so on and so forth so you can see here um, with all of our surveys that we have ongoing we have good coverage over everything that is shaded in this pick in this slide here um, so there are some of these other ones migratory liner pel pelagic netter and then if i scroll on to the next page uh, migratory netter that we don't have great coverage for. We do get some of those vessels, usually from the open access survey, but we don't get a lot of them. But we have really good coverage for everything that's shaded there. So that gives you a brief overview of what the IO model that we've got does. And then we've done a few research projects where we've linked that IO model to um, ecosystem model, primarily the Atlantis model, actually only the Atlantis model, I should say. Um, the first one was a paper I did with Isaac Kaplan, who was part of the seminar series a while, uh, a while back. Um, and uh, we, what it really was, was a management strategy evaluation for particulate management scenarios uh, in the, uh, on the West Coast, in the West Coast fleet. Uh, what would be the impacts, the economic impacts of those scenarios that were coming using the the harvest information that came out of Atlanta. So basically, it's pretty straightforward how to link up the two models once you figure out how the Atlantis fleets different from the IOPAC fleets and where they best line up. That's where we put the different multipliers for IOPAC. Then it's a matter of simply multiplication with the harvest expectations coming from Atlantis and the multiplier effects coming from IOPAC. Um, and what that allows you to do is get at things like this here, this next slide, which shows that for various different management scenarios, what the economic impacts of those management scenarios were going to be on a particular time horizon. I'm showing income on this slide, but we also did employment. Uh, now, that particular paper had nothing to do with climate change, but um, what it did do is allow us to see, learn about how to link up IOPAC with Atlantis. And so subsequent to that paper, Emma Hodgson, who was at UW at the time, is now at Simon Fraser University. She did a project where she took um, uh, a relatively long-term 50-year horizon on change in ocean conditions, uh, translated that into the, the expected biological changes that would occur uh, through from Atlantis, and then also from Atlantis got expected revenue changes by port uh, for various different IOPAC fleets, and then once again multiplied the, the various different multipliers coming from IOPAC uh, by the expected biological change, by expected harvest changes that were going to occur, and one of the things that one of the results quickly was that the northern ports that rely heavily on Dungeness crab would be the most affected in an economic sense uh, over a 50 year time horizon, but that the biological impacts were somewhat stronger in the south, but those species are not really, not in particular, direct targets of the commercial fisheries. Um, so I, there, there are some strengths to what we're doing here, trying to link up the I.O. model. Um, in particular, it's because it, uh, it's relatively easy to do, and it builds on existing modeling efforts. Uh, and both of the models that we're using have been re reviewed by the council and are currently being used elsewhere for policy analysis. And they're relatively easy to couple, uh, to link up, and, they, and they, the results tend to complement the other social vulnerability indices that exist. Uh, but there are some significant weaknesses. Um, and those weaknesses go back to the underlying assumptions in an IO model, uh, that there's 
There's no substitution of input. So in 50 years, I have no idea exactly what's going to happen to diesel prices and whether or not if diesel prices were to skyrocket, uh, whether or not vessels would increase their investment in better, more efficient diesel engines. But in an I.O. world, we're not allowed to allow, that is not permitted to change. So you're, you're sort of stuck with their current um, cost outlay in perpetuity into the future in an I.O. model. And, that there, and there's also no change in prices. So prices are exogenously determined. So in 50 years from now, the relative price of um, aquaculture seafood is very low compared to wild caught seafood you might expect there be some substitution towards the aquaculture seafood and as a result of that drive down demand for wild caught uh, i mean not uh, commercially wild caught seafood but uh but that change cannot happen as a result of the underlying assumption in io the io model so it brings you to this point where a cge model or computable general equilibrium model may be more appropriate at least it's more accepted in the academic literature over long-term time horizons there are certain attributes of cge models that make which make them more appealing one is that they do allow substitution between various factors of production and they and they allow differences in prices um, but there are some difficulties with doing cge models um, they are much more complicated and have much higher data requirements. I've listed some of the uh, parameters that you have to have if you were to go out and try to build a CGE model, and that's just a little short list of things that you have to have information on. Uh, the actual, the real list is much more extensive than that, which is not to say this can't be done. It can be done, it has been done. It's been, it's been done by uh, Chang Sung, at the Alaska Center, for example, he's done quite a bit of work in this area. Um, so in the long term, we may try to do something like this. I'm hopeful that we will. Um, and But there are, because of the data requirements are much higher, it requires a lot more industry aggregation. So you're not going to go back and have the 20 different vessel classifications that I have in IOPAC, for example. That's just too much. There won't be enough data to estimate all these parameters for all those different uh, sectors. And in addition, it requires greater spatial aggregation. So uh, port level stuff will probably not be very doable. Uh, you would probably have to look at impacts on a state or even a coastwide basis. And so that pretty much brings me to the end. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Kate, who has done some linking up uh, with IOPAC with some um, some, uh, some salmon participation modeling that she's done. All right, hello everybody. Um, thanks for being here. My name is Kate and as Dan said, I'm currently a postdoc at the University of Washington, also affiliated with the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. And today I'm going to talk to you about some work that we've done on predicting and quantifying impacts of salmon ocean fishery closures. Um, so just to give you some quick background on the West Coast ocean salmon fishery, a lot of you are probably familiar with it, but uh, just in case you're not, it targets mainly Chinook salmon using uh, troll gear. Um, although there are also some other species taken. Um, it's a pretty valuable fishery. Uh, landings over the past five years have ranged between uh, about 12 to $36 million in landings revenue. Um, and one important thing to note about this fishery is that it is a mixed stock fishery. So it's managed to minimize the impacts on weak stocks. So even when some runs are relatively strong, uh, the ocean season may be sharply curtailed in order to protect those weaker stocks. Um, so to give you a sense of sort of how this fishery compares to other fisheries on the West Coast, this sort of rainbow um, uh, figure here is showing uh, revenue by different management groups over the past couple of years. And you can see the blue here is salmon. And of that salmon troll, I think usually makes up between about a quarter and half of that revenue. Um, the rest comes from other uh, portions of the salmon fishery. 
Um, and um, as you can see from this figure here on the right, um, total, coast, total ocean landings uh, do vary a lot uh, year to year. And there's also this sort of general downward trend that we've seen since the 80s. Um, so we seem to be catching fewer salmon over time. Um, and a lot of the fluctuations we see in stocks can be attributed to a wide variety of factors. Um, those include hatchery production, as well as freshwater and ocean conditions. Um, so that means things like the historic California drought that we had a couple years ago and the marine heat wave, AKA the blob, um, those can have large impacts on salmon survival and reproductive success. And that in turn, of course, has implications for the salmon fishery. Um, so that interannual variability and success of different runs means that there's been uh, periodic closures of parts of the coast to salmon fishing over the years. So uh, this figure is showing the spatial extent of uh, different closures we've had over the past several decades. Um, you can see the largest one uh, occurred in 2008 and 9, where most of the coast um, south of Cape Falcon was closed to fishing. Um, and that was due to the collapse of the Sacramento River Fall Chinook. Uh, that run provides 80 to 95 percent of the of the salmon caught off the coast of California, as well as some of the some of the salmon caught in Oregon. Um, this was compounded by low coho returns and low Chinook returns in other rivers. Um, the collapse was attributed to poor ocean conditions in 2005 and 2006 which resulted in unusually poor survival of the 2004 and 2005 broods. Um, that might have also been compounded by a weakened portfolio effect in that river basin. Um, and like I said, the end result was this complete closure of the fishery south of Cape Falcon and a relatively restricted season elsewhere. So these closures, oh, I think we're missing a little bit of information there, but I'll just read it out to you. Um, <laughs> oh, there it is. Uh, so um, some of these closures have, of course, led to the declaration of federal fisheries disasters and the dispersal of federal aid to fishermen, as well as other salmon dependent businesses like uh, processors, um, tour guides, things like that. Um, so these arrows are showing uh, fishery fishery disasters over time that have been declared federal fishery disasters with the solid arrows being uh, coastwide disasters and the dashed arrows being uh, smaller scale disasters. Um, you can see that they have both become more frequent over time. And it seems like at least for the coastwide disasters, uh, the amount of aid being dispersed is growing. So from 1992 to 1995, that was a $29 million uh, aid package. And in 2008 and 9, that went up to 170 million. Um, and there's a, currently a request for aid uh, put in by the governors of California and Washington uh, because of the uh, Klamath fishery that has been highly restricted recently. So for the first part of this project, uh, we focused on what happened to fishermen during this historic closure in 2008 and 2009 that closed most of the fishery along the coast. Um, and in this case, we use vessels as a proxy for fishermen because unfortunately we can't observe fishermen directly. Um, and one thing to mention about these vessels is that they're extremely diverse in terms of what they harvest, um, where they fish, how much they fish, and in fact, it's actually pretty hard to even define what a salmon troll vessel is um, because there are a very diverse range of vessels that target salmon troll to a certain extent. Um, so what we did with these vessels was we took sort of a, a, a broad way of categorizing vessels. We looked at a wide range of vessels. Um, and we looked at whether or not they fish, how much money they make, uh, their participation in other fisheries in both closure and non-closure years. And we came up with a suite of vessel uh, characteristics um, that we correlated with these responses uh, with the idea that we could identify uh, certain kinds of vessels that would either be vulnerable to the effects of the closure or relatively resilient to it. 
So what we found, one of the major things that we found was um, that a common response during this 2008 and 2009 closure was that vessels just didn't go fishing at all. Um, and about 40% of vessels just didn't go fishing uh, either for salmon or for any other kinds of uh, uh, fisheries that they had participated in in the past. Um, and those vessels that stopped fishing tended to be more dependent on salmon. They tended to be less diversified in terms of their uh, revenue from different fisheries. They tended to be located further south along the coast, um, and they tended to be higher revenue, or at least I guess I should say um, outside of the closure, higher revenue vessels are more likely to go fishing, um, but that gap between the higher revenue vessels and lower re revenue vessels sort of narrowed during the closure. Um, and another thing to note here is that um, some of these vessels returned to fishing after that closure, but about 17% appear to have dropped out entirely. So we also looked at uh, how much money these vessels made uh, during the closure relative to their long-term means. And we found that unsurprisingly, vessels tended to make less money during this closure, particularly if they were more dependent on salmon, they had higher revenue, and if they and if they'd fished fewer years. Although um, the caveat that that relationship was pretty messy, there was a lot of unexplained variation, which kind of makes sense um, because these vessels do participate uh, in other fisheries and we're not really accounting for the variation in those other fisheries like crab, albacore, and groundfish. So we hypothesized that uh, if salmon isn't available, fishermen might be more likely to participate in the non-salmon fisheries that they had participated in in the past. Um, those major non-salmon fisheries are crab, which is basically Dungeness crab, uh, groundfish, and highly migratory species, which is mostly albacore tuna. Um, and what we found was there's actually surprisingly little evidence that fishers were more likely to participate in these alternate fisheries during the closure. Um, even though they had participated in these fisheries in the past, so presumably they have the expertise and the permits they need to participate in these fisheries. Uh, we also looked at uh, the total effort uh, measured in terms of trips taken in other fisheries. And again, we found that it does not appear that fishermen changed their overall effort in these fisheries during the closure. Um, and that's true whether we looked at all vessels or just that uh, subset of vessel, excuse me, that subset of vessels that continued to fish during the closure. Um, and I'm not really showing the results here, but I'm also just going to mention that we also looked at whether the seasonal allocation of effort differed uh, inside and outside of that closure period with the idea that if uh, fishermen can't go fishing for salmon during their usual time, uh, they might target other species during that time, resulted, resulting in sort of an altered intraseasonal pattern of effort uh, in other fisheries. And again, we found no evidence of altered behavior in other fisheries. So one of the conclusions that we drew uh, from this portion of the project is that fishermen might not be able to easily use other fisheries as a buffer against reduced salmon availability. Uh, in reality, they may have limited options in the face of the salmon closure. Uh, they may already be maximizing their investment in other fisheries and don't really have a feasible substitute for salmon during that season. Um, and this is a quote from a, from a fisherman interviewed by uh, another group of researchers sort of reinforcing that. Um, he says, if you take away one of those income streams, it's not like you can create more by increasing your catch with albacore or crab. Um, this is also, um, it at least somewhat fits with the, the responses to the survey that Dan talked about. Um, so with the caveat that the responses I'm showing here um, come from all fishermen, not just salmon fishermen. Uh, but the survey found that the large majority of fishermen uh, said that they have been affected by fishery closures, and the majority said that they responded by either doing work outside of fishing or they didn't do any other work at all. Um, and about 40% did say that they fished in another fishery. Um, and I'm not entirely sure whether to interpret this as they uh, replaced that closed fishery with another or if they just kept fishing in the same alternate fisheries that they had in the past. 
Um, but hopefully we'll do some more analysis on that and kind of drill down a little bit deeper into that uh, information. Um, so we wanted to uh, extend this approach to make some predictions about what the effects of the 2017 closure might be. And this closure was precipitated by extremely low projected returns of Klamath River Fall Chinook. So the council ended up deciding to close the fishery entirely between uh, Florence, Oregon and, and Horse Mountain in California. Um, and our idea was that uh, potentially an early prediction of the effects of this closure could help uh, inform decision makers when they're thinking about disaster aid. Um, and I do want to add that quantifying the economic impacts of closures is pretty challenging. Uh, for example, I found two uh, gray literature analyses of the 2008 and 2009 closure. Um, and across those two uh, analyses, the estimated impacts in terms of jobs and revenue basically order uh, vary by an order of magnitude. So there's a lot of ways to sort of look at these closures. And I'm just going to talk about one. So what we did is we took the modeling framework that I talked about earlier that we used for this 2008 and 9 uh, closure. Um, and we sort of extended that to look at a suite of closures and to make predictions about uh, behavior uh, based on this suite of vessel characteristics and on the characteristics of the current uh, salmon troll fleet or what we define as the current salmon troll fleet. Um, so we asked um, if there's a closure, will they fish that year? And if so, will they participate in salmon fishing? And then we compare that to predictions in the absence of a closure. Uh, we then took that one step further and linked that to the IO model that Jerry was talking about. So we could uh, generate predicted income, sales, and jobs under both closure and non-closure scenarios. Um, and one sort of major assumption that we made in this was that we assumed that non-salmon revenue is equal to the five-year mean um, of that vessel uh, over the past five years, which is, you know, potentially kind of a big assumption. Um, but we couldn't really think of a better way to do it without trying to model those alternate fisheries, which would have made a, a much more challenging project that uh, could not have been done in a short amount of time. Um, so what our results told us is that we predict 50 to 75 vessels uh, are likely not to fish at all. Um, given a closure scenario, and uh, an additional 160 would go fishing, but not for salmon. So once we link that to the IO model, that translates into uh, between 5.8 and 8.9 million in lost income, 12.8 uh, to 19.6 uh, lost sales, and 200 to 330 jobs. Um, and I do want to note that this is not a complete estimate of the impacts of the closure. Um, so we're just looking at the impacts of this spatial closure on vessels that uh, participate in the salmon troll fishery. So this doesn't account for um, the closure of in-river fisheries. This doesn't account for the limitations on the season outside of the closed areas. And this doesn't uh, account for impacts on, say, the recreational fishery. So this is um, just a partial estimate of the total impacts um, of the 2017 salmon season. Um, so as you might expect, these impacts are not distributed evenly in space, uh, with Brookings, Coos Bay, Eureka, and Fort Bragg having the largest impacts. Um, the vessels in Coos Bay, in particular, were expected to see a 47% decrease in employment, 33% uh, decrease in sales, and a 31% decrease in income. Um, so we should hopefully have the data to test these predictions soon. I think um, pretty shortly all the fish tickets will be in Paxson, so we can actually test our predictions. Um, and one sort of you know optimistic note to end on is uh, this headline that I saw on uh, seafoodnews.com a couple days ago uh, saying that prices were the only bright spot for Pacific salmon trollers last year um, and that this reduced availability of salmon really uh, led to extremely high prices, which might have helped buffer uh, salmon fishermen and other salmon-dependent businesses uh, against the 
effects of the closure. And that is all I have. So I think at this point, we're going to turn it over for questions. Hey, thanks everyone. Uh, so this is Yvonne. I'm gonna just start off with a question of my own and then um, turn it over to the rest of the ecosystem work group to see if they have any questions. Um, my question is, have you guys thought about or looked at, or do you have any way of looking at, um, uh, I'm wondering about fishermen who might participate in uh, commercial fisheries, but also use their boats as captains for chartering in recreational fisheries. And I know that probably doesn't help in years when, um, when salmon fisheries are closed since everything's closed. But uh, I, I didn't know if looking across the fisheries was possible or if there's any way of looking at that. Yeah. It might be possible. I know of some people that uh, I know, I, well, I don't know how many, but I know I definitely know of one individual um, who is has a, a, a commercial salmon permit and also a charter vessel permit for the state of Washington. Um, so you might be, you could potentially go to those um, license databases and see who is authorized, which which vessels are authorized to do both, um, and then go examine their commercial landing to see how how much how much activity they have on the commercial side on the on the rec side. Um, it may be very difficult to quantify the amount of activity they're doing on the rec side. Okay, thanks. And then I had another question. Oh, shoot, just put that in my brain. Never mind. Um, ecosystem work group folks, do you have any further questions for the, our speakers? Hey, this is Corey. I've got one if no one else. Please go yet. ahead, Corey. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you all for the presentations. Um, this one's probably for Jerry. And Jerry, um, Amy heard ask something similar of Isaac on webinar number two, I think. But um, you know, as you know, the, the council and, and everyone around the council is really interested in, in making a strong link to. Uh, what you guys are talking about in this climate initiative, the, the social and economic aspects. And um and I'm excuse me if you've already done this in a paper, but on with on your your IOPAC Atlantis type work, um mm -hmm. is there a way like we can you guys see a way that we can like take what we've seen in the uh the climate change stock vulnerability stock assessment um and then make a Make make the connection to the to the economics. For example, just ask Isaac to plug in a scenario of you know 50 years from now, and you've caveated with with all the assumptions of why prices might be different and all that. But if you just all of a sudden pluffed what we think is going to happen in 50 years down on the current world, what would the effect be? Have you have you done that? Would it be worth doing? Um, or do you have any other ideas of how we? Well, I I make it happen? I, I I don't know much about the, the stock assessment vulnerabilities that you're talking about, but um, it, it, kind of in a way, uh, part of what we did with Emma's work, um, Emma Hutchins work, was to say uh, over a 50 year time horizon, we expect there to be certain changes in ocean conditions. Those ocean conditions drive changes in the biological environment. And then from Atlantis, you also get an expectation on how much uh, changes in harvest there will be. Um, so, I mean, the, the real trick would be in whatever expectation you have on the stock assessment side, if, if Atlantis and, and, and Isaac can translate that into harvest, uh, we, can certainly we can certainly put economic impacts to that. Um, as I mentioned, there are, there are caveats <laughs> with I.O. models, but you're, you're kind of stuck with them. But for now, I mean, um, I, I have no idea how much the relative prices of diesel fuel versus 
uh, you know, uh, better uh, uh, sonar equipment or whatever vessels use to target fish. I have no idea how those prices might change in the future. Maybe they'll all be solar powered by that. Yeah, they, well, they, yeah, maybe, 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 maybe we'll go back to clipper ships or something <laughs> to harvest fish. I don't know, but, <laughs> um, but anyway, the, the trick would be to if the land if the landis could spit out um, uh, harvest expectations, maybe. Um, and I, I don't know. That's a question for Isaac. I don't know. I mean, it, it would seem that if you have certain expectations on stock assessment, you would, if you're going to run that way into the future, you're also going to be stuck with um, some sort of crude metric of how much attainment is going to be in the future. Um, so, I mean, if you know, if you if you if you expect sablefish stocks to go way up. Uh, can you also pin that sablefish attainment is going to be similar to what it's going to be today? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, well, yeah, sounds like we should take a close look at the, the Emma's paper there, see what's already been done. Yeah, and I think, I mean, the other thing about it too is, I mean, not only input prices or inputs, like, you know, are they, you know, are they going to be using diesel vessels that are much more efficient ones, but you know the relative prices of of um, fish as well are certainly likely to change pretty dramatically, not least because of uh, the kind of rise of aquaculture. Yeah, yeah, and I mentioned that when I in my presentation is that the relative price of sort of wild caught fish versus aquaculture raised fish, it, I mean that could change dramatically in 50 years. But using the I/O approach, you're sort of stuck with their current relative prices. So um, Richard Scully ha had a question earlier. So Richard, if you want to go ahead to uh, mute yourself and do so. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. I, I have uh, I have two questions. I think I'll ask one now, and then uh, I'll ask another one a little later after other people have a chance. But, but the first one has to do with that 2008-2009 sort of a failure of, of, of Sacramento Falls Chinook, which which uh, led to the closure. Uh, that that closure was, was was did not include Washington. I don't I don't believe it was it was uh, Cal California and maybe a lot of Oregon, maybe up to Cape Falcon. And I'm not sure of that. But, but no, that's uh, correct as far as I know. What happens? Um, do those do those commercial fishermen, the, the trollers, do they then um, are they then al allowed to move into that Washington fishery, or or do you have to get a uh, a license for a particular area ahead of time, and maybe it's, and it's limited entry? Um, and that that question would lead to if 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 the fishermen from California, Oregon, could then move up into the Washington area, then that might kind of swamp that fishery, which probably is fully um, uh, used already. And there's a fixed quantity of salmon that you're allowed to harvest up there. Would that just cut into the income of all the other fishermen and shorten the season? How do how do those things? Um, well, what, I what happened? It happened. I, I believe, and if somebody knows better than me, they can correct me, but I believe you're right in that um, those Oregon and California fishermen would need to get some kind of Washington permit. Do you guys? At least to land there, right? At least to land there. But they could probably fish up there, but then they'd have to land. Yeah. There. They couldn't land the fish. Um, and I did actually, I looked at um, some sort of rough metrics of spatial movement for these vessels. I didn't present any of the results here. Um, but it didn't really look to me like they there was any evidence of vessels moving up to Washington to fish. Um, I'm not entirely clear on whether that's due to you know regulatory issues or whether they just sort of realized that uh, you know the salmon season in Washington wasn't going to be that great anyway, um, and there's you know going to be fierce competition for what's there already. Um, but you know I, I did look into that at one point, and it really seemed like there was no reason to think that um, anybody from Oregon or California was moving up 
and fishing Washington salmon. I think there are some vessels that have permits in more than one state. There are, yes, that's true. Um, and and they, but they may be fishing up there already. Yeah. Um, and you know, mm -hmm. whether or not that means they would have put more effort in Washington right. or not, you know, they might have. But you would have accounted for that. I believe so. Yeah. Thank you. So. Richard's question, I had something similar, and actually I also just got an email from Deb Wilson Vandenberg who had a similar question she wanted me to ask. So is so do you think that the availability or costs of permits in other fisheries affects, well, I guess it does, uh, affects fishermen's ability to sort of flex between fisheries? And I guess Related to that, what are what are some of the other factors that might um, cause people to choose to not fish at all um, <laughs> versus fishing in other fisheries? Is that something that you looked at or know about? Um, it's something I can definitely speculate about. Um, it's not something I've actually quantified. Um, I do think you're right that the cost of moving into other fisheries, if you don't have another permit, is um, extremely high. Um, you know, I talked to a couple of fishermen, just sort of anecdotally, their experience, and what I heard was basically, um, you know, if you have a crab permit, you're probably already maxing out your effort in the crab fishery because that's a winter fishery. Um, if you don't have a crab permit, um, they're extremely expensive to buy and hard to get. Um, there's a little bit of uh, open access sable fish that potentially um, some people might try to target during the regular salmon fishing season, but that's, uh, there's a really uh, relatively minute amount of that available. Um, did somebody want to uh, interject there? No, maybe not. Um, and uh, you know, albacore again is a is potentially um, an alternative, but um, I believe you have to have a fairly large boat to be able to go after albacore, um, and a lot of these salmon vessels are quite small. Um, and can you remind me what the second part of your question was? I think you covered it. I was just sort of, you know, wondering if you had speculations on um, other reasons that people might not flex into other fisheries. And of course, it had occurred to me, you know, different gear types or different vessel types. And, but you're right, there's a lot of um, permitting requirements and, and we have few opportunities, um, few open access opportunities on the management side you know we often think open access well that just makes it more challenging to manage and leads to over capacity but you can kind of see where you know there are some benefits to maintaining some open access fisheries and i think also um some of the survey responses once uh, those get worked up might uh might shed some more light on this especially um the sort of I think there's sort of two two potential ways that that um, might play in. One is um, I think there's some evidence that uh, salmon fishermen in particular sort of get uh, sort of an extra they uh, more of their personal identity potentially um, comes from salmon fishing, and so other fisheries just might not be that appealing. Um, and uh, I think a lot of fishermen also have um, income from non-fishing work. Um, so it may be that those people who uh, didn't go fishing at all decided that, you know, whatever their other income source was, not from fishing became uh, more appealing during that time. Yeah, I think uh, to add to that, I think, I mean, in salmon fishery in particular, there's a lot of very small scale fishers. I suspect, in fact, that a lot of them are actually not making any profits at all. Um, and um, you know, or maybe doing it, their involvement in fishing is more, almost a quasi-recreational uh, thing for some, for many of them. And and um, you know, so they they may have other sources of income. They don't really have to make make that up. It wasn't you know a, a key thing for them, and th that can show up in the survey. I suspect that you know when you look at other fisheries like a you know a closure in the crab fishery or maybe groundfish or something. 
uh, or shrimp, uh, you know, those, some of those individuals that have other options might be much more likely to to switch into into another fishery. And that's something that you know we'll be looking at as we proceed with this with this project that I discussed in the first presentation and and looking you know doing the participation choice modeling for this larger set of fishers and fisheries. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Therese. Yeah, I had a couple of questions and maybe a couple of comments. Uh, just for Oregon, and I'm not so um, familiar with the other states, but pretty much all of our fisheries, our commercial fisheries, are some form of limited entry, at least all the major ones, except for albacore. And it's kind of been viewed as, you know, our last relief valve for switching should there be a downturn in one of the others. And of course, as folks have noted, there are, you know, difficulties for some uh, vessels to be able to access fish farther offshore, uh, maybe not the gear and, and other um, reasons that they may not be able to switch um, if there's a downturn in salmon, for example. Uh, one of the other um, things I might mention that we see at, at times here are a number of large uh, larger, um, relatively speaking, sport vessels that are really licensed commercial vessels because they get tax write-offs for commercial fishing. Uh, so you may see them participate from time to time, but in large measure, they're not really commercial vessels per se. Um, that may be part of the what you're seeing when the season you know, is not so good for salmon. I don't know how big a portion that is, but um, industry brings that up from time to time. But what I really wanted to ask about is um, there are a number of efforts embarking on management strategy evaluations uh, for the council um, related activities. And they're usually aimed at single species, um, some internationally underway for albacore and, and beginning ones that maybe on the West Coast for other species. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about how to develop strategies that might be able to accommodate both the, you know, full-time targeter of that particular species and the participants who have multi-species or multi-activity portfolios in their, um, you know, fishing profiles and how to figure out how to factor that in. And this may not be something you can answer at the moment. I'm just trying to, you know, think about ways to address it in my own mind. Yeah. So this is this is Dan Holland here, and that is kind of the the, the overall goal of the of the first project that we discussed in the first presentation is to build a model that can can look at those kind of questions. I hesitate to call it a management strategy evaluation exactly because. Um, uh, you know, I'm not sure whether we'll kind of be able to deal with all sources of uncertainty um, that you kind of typically want to do in a, in a true management strategy evaluation. But the um, the idea is to build that system of linked models of different fisheries that we think are connected um, by participation choices as opposed to necessarily ecologically. Um, and then be able to use that model to say, well, you know, what what happens when we do have um, a shock that, like you know, some something like the blob or or something that affects that affects productivity in one species or another, uh, and then you know may transmit through to other species. And we, then what we can do with that, we have a participation model that that will that will be estimated based on um, you know statistical model that's based on the current data. Uh, and but we can also then use that model to look at well what if we sort of remove some of the constraints and allow allow people to um, move more between fisheries how does that affect the dynamics of the system does it become um, you know more resilient or less resilient uh, does it sort of exasperate exacerbate the, the ups and downs in the system or or remediate them um, so that's kind of the hope is to do that with that model. But as you start to move away from 
the reality in terms of you know a, a, syst a system of, or a way of regulating the fisheries that was already in place and that we were you know in a, a statistical model that was estimated from actual observations to you know some significant change in the way that the fisheries are regulated particularly um, access rights to fisheries um, then it becomes more speculative um, useful I think for understanding what the what you know changing those constraints might be but um, probably less predictive thanks I think that that does answer what my question is I guess I'm trying to um, think about you know how useful then the single species um, type management strategy evaluations may be or what we need to pair up with from the directions of the models that you're developing and, and try and integrate that those themes into the single species approaches to me they both sort of seem to be going on simultaneously but right now there maybe not uh, a linkage between them yeah yeah well we i mean we do with our modeling we do intend to kind of build in the biological models as much as possible to um, to be based on the the single species models that have been developed. So, for example, the the MSC, the Management Strategy Evaluation, being developed for Albacore, um, I've talked to the person that's working on that, and you know, our hope is to basically take that model um, and integrate it into our multi fishery model. And um, we're we're trying to pull in Oli Shelton and some of the work that he's been doing on modeling salmon. Um, we'll pull that in. Um, you know some of the ground fish assessment models et cetera so we'll kind of try and piece these together uh, as much as possible keeping the biological models um, as similar as possible to the existing stock assessment models where they exist of course some of them they don't for example crab and shrimp um, and but there has been work done on modeling uh, at least crab that we can use uh, and then we'll you know we tie those fisheries together with our participation choice model Great, thanks. Okay, we're getting close to three o'clock, but I want to make sure we get to any public questions that may be um, there may be on the line. And so I'm going to just ask if you're a member of the public and you want to ask a question. Uh, the process is to use your go-to meeting um, control panel to to click that little raise hand button which is a, like a gray hand with a green arrow so if you cl click on that if you have any questions and kit doll will let us know and anyone on the work group do you have any further questions well i see richard um he's, he's <laughs> acting like a member of the public and he had his hand up yeah. so he's very polite while richard's warming up i might have one more to give on Okay, go ahead. Okay, are you, uh, can you hear me? This is Richard. Yep. Yes, go ahead, Richard. Corey, if you wouldn't mind waiting. Sure Sorry, Corey. Um, what, one, one short comment and then a question. The comment is uh, a fish processor uh, in our salmon advisory sub panel noted uh, last year uh, when there was a uh, a small harvest of Chinook salmon expected that that was going to cause a lot of his buyers to switch over and start buying farm-raised Atlantic salmon and that and that uh, in the long run some of those buyers may not switch back to buy wild Chinook once the uh, population responds so that was a, 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 a concern to him um, the uh, the question is that uh, as pH uh, um, level decreases over time. Um, are are you um, sociologist types uh, working with the biologists and oceanographers to maybe make some predictions as to which fisheries might decline, such as perhaps Dungeness crab, if if the pH gets so low to where that that uh, significantly affects their their uh, shell production and how that will affect fishing communities. Thank you. In the presentation, I, I showed some work that Emma Hodgson has done, which showed exactly that, that 
uh, based over a 50-year time horizon, the expectation is that the, the sort of very northern California, Oregon, and Washington ports would be the most adversely affected in large part because of their, their heavily reliance on Dungeness Crab. Uh, and that paper is currently in review. It's been submitted to a journal. Um, I, 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 I certainly don't mind passing it out, but I'd need to, I'm one of the co-authors of many, uh, so I'd, I'd need to get some sort of permission from the other folks involved if I could pass it around before it's been accepted or, or rejected, whichever happens. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that, that, that sort of work has been done to some extent, and that's what was the topic of that paper that I referred to uh, by where Emma Hodgson is the primary author. And just one thing to add about Dungeness Crab, just because that's a, um, something that I've been working on recently, not um, not directly involved in the OA stuff, but I think if this is the same Atlantis model that was uh, in, I think it was Kristen was the first author. Um, Kristen Marshall. I think they found that the largest impacts on Dungeness crab would not be directly through physiological effects on, you know, their uh, shell building, but on their prey species. Um, and I think one additional concern that, as far as I know, has not been um, incorporated in these models is that um, the general thought is that in a lot of years, the population is recruitment limited. Um, and there's some work from uh, Paul McElhaney and his colleagues showing that ocean acidification is, uh, increases mortality of Dungeness so I think that that might be a, uh, an important thing to consider also potentially in future models is also looking at uh, the influence on just uh, survival until recruitment. Thank you. Uh, Corey, did you want to jump in with a question? Sure. Uh, if anyone for the public wants to go, I don't mean to jump the line again, but um, I guess my question to all of you is, you know, Dan, we've already asked this of you, and you know, we're we're kind of struggling a bit with um, in this climate change initiative of what to do next. So, uh, you know, simply put, what what should we do next to make these these links um, these links between the you know the, the climate forecast and the and the economic and social you know impacts of that? Where what can we do over the short term while we're waiting for? Your project to mature, Dan. Um, you guys, have any ideas of where the? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, we're 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 working on things. I guess we're working on things. Maybe you know, focusing more on one fishery at a time. Um, but um, I guess I don't really have a good answer for you about that. Yeah. Or, <laughs> We just haven't, you know, we've been, I think everyone's been kind of focused on single species, single fishery yeah. stuff up to now. Um, and, um, you know, less on interconnect, interconnections. But, you know, at, at least with with the salmon fishery, it, you know, one thing it suggests is that there's the, the interconnections may be less than we kind of suspected um, because of the, the fact that, you know, people are somewhat limited in their ability to move between fisheries because of... Uh, uh, the access constraints. Okay, thank you, okay. Jerry. Thank you. Um, I just want to check, Kit, do we have anyone else uh, or anyone from the public who has any questions? Uh, I don't see anybody with their hand raised, um, I guess uh, I I have a question if that's okay. Go ahead. I'm, a, I'm nice either fish nor fowl, but I guess this was maybe um, directed um, to all of the presenters, but in particular to Kate. Um, I thought relevant to her presentation. Probably another hard question, but I was thinking about: or Do you have sort of any thoughts about how? the results of your work or your methodology would, uh, you know, be brought into or applied to the policy making process. So, you know, for example, uh, the council has a decision process for setting uh, 
the salmon seasons annually and um so i'm you know that's one framework for where the effects of management are um, considered but i'm not sure if you're thinking in that context or what how this or you know that's kind of yours i think is is sort of a short time horizon prediction methodology and then of course you have uh, like um, jerry was talking about i think uh, prediction frameworks on a very long time scale, but I'm just curious across those time scales, how they might interface with the policy making process. Sure. Um, I think in terms of the council, um, you know, this, it's not a process that I've been deeply involved with. So, you know, this is a, a view from the outsider. Um, and as far as I know, the council is pretty constrained, um, by you know the uh, the regulations on these uh, you know uh, runs that are protected, um, I think there there are a lot of mandates to uh, to protect those runs, and I'm not entirely sure how you know considerations like uh, economic impacts on fishermen and communities play into that process. Um, but if that is something they consider, you know I think that this framework could potentially be linked to that. Um, and also, I guess if um, if the council is concerned about impacts of restrictions on other fisheries, um, you know, at least our our data so far seems to indicate that um, you know there's not a lot of movement into other fisheries in the short term. But I think it would be interesting to look at sort of more long term strategies. Um, you know, I can imagine there are potentially some fishermen out there who are looking at what's been happening um, in the salmon fishery recently and saying, you know, like, oh man, you know, I gotta try to move into a different fishery because the salmon have just been doing so badly recently. Um, so, you know, there may be some concerns over, over um, you know, longer term attrition from the salmon fishery or longer term changes in behavior in the salmon fishery, I would guess. Um, and I'm not sure if that's the kind of thing that the council is interested in. Um, but, but if they are, you know, I think that would be something to think about. Okay. Well, with that, unless folks have other questions, I just wanted to thank all of you. Um, you know, for me, I feel like the work that you're presenting today and that you're doing gives us a more multi-dimensional view of the folks who participate in our fisheries rather than just sort of one income point on a you know on some graph it gives us more of a why they do what they do and why they make the decisions they do so that's really helpful in sort of building up a bigger picture of of where we want to go with fisheries management into the future so so thank you for sharing your work with us today and um, we'll look forward to hearing more from you in the future. And with that, I just want to do a one last check and see if there are any further questions before we uh, end our webinar series. I, I don't see anybody waving their hand in the virtual air. So I think, I think we can wrap up here, both this webinar and the webinar series. So. Okay. Thanks to everybody who participated. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. And um, the ecosystem work group will be providing short, um, possibly too short, um, but uh, I always like to write short, <laughs> um, summaries of these webinars. But um, they're also up on the council website if you want to go back and uh, re-listen to sections. And so thank you also to the council staff for managing all this. I know this has been pretty intense and we really appreciate Kit, your support and also Sandy and Chris for keeping us all on track and making sure things have run smoothly. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.